How's everybody doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berquist. So yesterday I brought everybody kind of a lesson learned, you know, basically how, how can good loans go bad very quickly? And today I wanted to bring you guys uh, kind of a different thing, a little bit of a story time. I wanted to talk about a very successful uh, bank that started out as what we call in the industry a de novo startup bank. And it's basically grown into a very successful $50 billion asset financial institution, uh, Pinnacle Financial Partners. And we're going to look at an article here. But uh, what I wanted to do was today, uh, so I'm going to kind of tell this story. This article is basically an interview of the bank chairman and CEO telling the story of this bank. So I'm going to kind of read uh, this interview for everybody, and we're gonna it'll it'll kind of tell the story, and um, and then as we get kind of to the end, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about you know what does it take to run a successful de novo bank? You know how do we you know how do you how do you kind of start the bank? What are some of the things you need to do, and how can you make it successful over the years? So let's get uh, let's get into this here. So here's the article from Bank Director, so exclusive, an interview with Pinnacle Financial Partner CEO and Chairman. Uh, Terry Turner and Rob McCabe Jr. Uh, wanted to be entrepreneurs early on, but started one of the fastest growing franchises in the country, and it wasn't easy. So Pinnacle Financial Partners uh, has had an enviable growth story. It started up in 2000. The bank commands the largest deposit market share in the Nashville, Tennessee MSA, beating bigger banks such as Bank of America Corp and Regions Financial Corp, according to the FDIC. The Nashville-based uh, the Nashville-based banking company has assets of 50.7 billion, mostly through organic growth, and about 128 offices in Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Virginia, Florida, South Carolina, and Maryland. Uh, the following interview is an edited, condensed version of an on-stage conversation at Bank Directors. Uh, bank board training forum in September when editor-in-chief Naomi Snyder interviewed CEO M. Terry Turner and chairman Robert McCabe Jr. So uh, how did this relationship start? You first met in 1979. So Turner, uh, Rob was working at a small bank, Park National Bank in Knoxville, Tennessee. I was in the consulting business with Arthur Anderson and we had a small engagement there. I met Rob the first week or so I was there. Uh, we became fast friends and we've sort of lived our lives together from then until now. So in those days, the government basically told you what you could give to your customers as the deposit rate and what you could make in loans. It wasn't very exciting in a lot of ways. Turner says um, it was exciting if you wanted to make money because it was easier to make money. The spread they dictated was wide enough. Uh, you could make a big profit. So, but what did you do to make Park National Bank special? Uh, McCabe says, as a result of that environment, uh, bankers were complacent and they were happy with their client base. Growing the profitability seemed to be less of a concern. So we put a lot of outbound energy into adding clients at whatever the spread was to growing the bank and hiring experienced people. And then Turner says, uh, Rob and I, every time we'd get frustrated, we'd say, we're going to quit the banking business and go do something ourselves. Uh, we were seriously handicapped because we had no capital, so we didn't ever make it very far. Uh, we'd go out and visit with clients, business people we respected, talk to them about what our opportunities were. Uh, the company we were working for, Park National Bank, was sold to a company called First American National Bank, and the trading symbol was FANB. And I'll never forget one of those guys after we talked to him for a while about what we wanted to do. He said, guys, I don't think you're well suited to be entrepreneurs. You need to be fan bankers. <laughs> so McCabe said, uh, so we became generalists at this point in time. We got a lot of general experience in all areas of the bank. Now, everybody you deal with is a specialist. So. So what happened to push you into starting up this bank? So Turner says, First American made a flawed acquisition in 1998. In fact, there was a sell-side analyst named Sean Ryan for Bear Stearns. He was quoted calling the transaction the worst transaction in the history of banking. So ultimately, it cost us the company. Uh, the CEO came up with a plan to make the company and AM South acquired First American in 1999. Uh, Rob and I were technically employees of AM South until year end at 1999. So I was deselected 
from the banking leadership. Uh, that's what that's what put us in play. Uh, we had different opportunities, maybe to, to run other banks or do different things. But for me, the appeal was to start a bank from scratch. Um, most of those people are looking at you like, listen, pal, I was here when you rode up and I'll be here when you're gone. I don't have to do what you say. Um, it was fun to start with a clean sheet of paper. Uh, that was a big motivation for me. So and then what kind of challenges did you face along the way to get into the banking business? You've got to have a license, a bank charter to get that. You have to go put together an incredibly in-depth plan, a 10-year pro forma, uh, which always struck me as ludicrous. Uh, we didn't have one employee or one client or any idea what interest rates would do, but we were going to give them a 10-year pro forma on what the bank would do. But we did that. Uh, we submitted this package of paper and this 26-year-old lady who was working for the OCC in Atlanta uh, had 26 penetrating questions about our application. And the first question was, we believe Monsieur, Monsieur's Turner and McCabe are country club bankers and not likely to know how to run a small bank. <laughs> That's great. Country club bankers. Um, that was the first challenge. It's a terribly bureaucratic process. Uh, we needed a bank charter and a holding company charter at the Federal Reserve. I remember talking to a regulator and I said, look, when are we going to get the answer? And he said, it's been approved all the way up to here, but it's got to get through this desk over there. He said, you sound like you're in a hurry. I said, well, we're burning $7,000 a day here. Um, and he says, I remember you telling me years ago that you didn't want to hire anyone who was unemployed. Can you explain that a little bit? Our thesis was, if we could hire experienced people who had proven track records, had strong client followings and so forth, then we could win the service and advice equation. Uh, we said, number one, we won't hire anybody that has less than 10 years experience. I think over the years, we've modified that for a few jobs down to five years, but everybody has experience. Uh, we don't teach anybody how to play and receive. How to, how to spread a financial statement, how to protect collateral. Uh, the average experience of people that we have hired in this company is 23 years. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic difference in terms of their ability to take care of clients as well as their competence. Uh, we've been one of the fastest growing banks in the United States. If you hire somebody who's been handling a book of business for two and a half decades, two things happen. You get rapid growth because they can move that book of business quickly and you get strong asset quality because they know those clients. Uh, we don't take applications. We don't hire people who are circulating resumes. Our view has generally been if they're coming in to fill out an application or they're circulating a resume, they're likely unhappy or unsuccessful where they are. And if that's the case, we'd appreciate it if they stay there. Um, you and Rob have been friends for a long time. Is that a benefit or is that a drawback? And how do you disagree? The relationship between us is more akin to brothers. I had an older brother in my life. Nobody would have would had nearly as many fights with my brother as I did. None of them would have been as fierce as with my brother. But at the end, I have a high respect and a great rapport with him. Rob and I would be the same. Uh, we can argue about things and see completely different on one topic and be thrilled with each other on the next. It's just that sort of relationship. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be? And then Turner answered, in a leadership team, retreat early on in the company, we decided how cool would it be if we could get 1,000 families to live out of this business? And of course, today there's 3,500 families that live out of it. So I'm talking with employees, associates that make their living out of this company. We give shares to everybody in the company, both when they come on and on an annual basis. I take great pride in what's been built. Uh, but I do want to make a difference in people li people's lives and feel like I did something that helped other people. So, um, so that's a, that's a great, great article from these, these two gentlemen who had this great relationship, you know, started out working, you know, one guy started out working in banking. Uh, the other guy was, was working in accounting at Arthur Anderson, basically doing bank audits, bank audit work. And the two of them basically got together. You know, the one guy went in, started started working. They were working together at the same bank, but the bank did a did a bad merger, got kind of messed up, and then they ended up getting acquired by another bank. And that was what in 1999 opened them the door to basically go out and say, "Hey, we're going to start this de novo bank." But you could see 
uh, that they ran into a lot of questions. You know, you have to have a license. You have to have a bank charter that that charter is issued by the state that you're in. So you have to go to this your, your local state uh, bank regulator and you have to get them to issue you a state charter. Uh, you know, you could get a national charter, but that national charter is granted by the OCC. Uh, but again, but for most de novo banks, they're just going to simply start out working in the bank that they're in. Now, this bank today has a national charter because they're operating in, in, a, in a number of states. Um, and, and basically they had to put together, you know, so you had to, you know, so you had to do a couple of things. You had to, you had to put together this 10 year pro forma. You have to go into the regulators. You have to, you have to put together a leadership team. You have to report to them. You know, you have to, you have to, you know, pitch the regulators on what you're doing. You have to basically say, Hey, uh, this is, this is our business plan. This is our proposal. This is the bank we want to start. Here are the professionals that we're bringing in that are going to be on the leadership team that are going to help us run the bank. And, and then you have to go out and you have to raise capital. Uh, but they also talked about kind of the timing of this thing. The, you know, these things don't, it's a very bureaucratic process. These things do not move very fast. And like he says there, he says, or he says, well, you know, the regulatory guy says, hey, you sound like you're in kind of a hurry there. And he says, well, yeah, we're burning $7,000 a day. Um, and, and that's kind of that's kind of the thing. You know, the regulators, unfortunately, don't really care how much money you're burning through every day. They don't they don't really care what your your plight is. They're going to they're going to approve it as they see fit when they see it. Um, and, and like I said, it's amazing the kind of. Um, it's amazing some of the, the treatment you get, you know, oh, these guys are just a bunch of country club bankers. They don't know how to run a bank. They don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, like that, and, and that happens, that happens, that happens. And these are, again, these are people that have worked in the business. I mean, these are, these are people with a lot of, these are, pro, these are highly experienced professionals working in the business that say, Hey, we want to start a bank and they're, and they're, and yet the regulators are still sitting there going, yeah, these guys are basically a bunch of clowns. They don't know. They don't really know how to run a bank. They don't really know what they're doing. Um, so imagine if you come from outside the industry and you go to them and you want to start a bank, like, how's that, how's that going to go? Right. So, uh, so, and I, again, I look at this from a couple different perspectives. So I started my career working for a bank that grew into what you would call a super regional bank. It grew into a 52 asset bank with 450 branches operating in nine States, all up and down the East coast. Uh, it was a, a one or one of my wonderful, wonderful bank to work for. And so I I worked at a bank like that and it, and it grew with nothing but organic growth, uh, total organic growth. They did not they did not do any acquisitions. Uh, they prided themselves on not doing acquisitions and simply doing organic growth. So so I have an appreciation having worked at that bank for where this bank is at right now, being 50 billion operating, it's, it's almost, it's almost identical, like 50 billion operating in nine, nine states. Um, you know, they've got over, uh, what did they say? I think they said how many branches, um, 128, basically 128 offices, 128 branches, um, operating in a lot of states. Uh, you know, so I, I have a, a good feeling for like where this bank is right now. And then the other thing is I also worked at a pure de novo startup bank that started from scratch. And I was basically there for seven years and grew from nothing to 150 million in assets. And so I have the de novo bank experience. So I also understand, I understand exactly where these guys are coming from, from the point of view of where, you know, starting a bank from scratch and how appealing that can be and how it, the, the challenges that go along with that and kind of uh, starting out and growing something. And, and you know, and, and there is, um, you know, there is nothing better than, you know, uh, starting a bank or even starting any company and, and growing it and, and seeing it become profitable and then seeing it become successful, seeing it grow, adding new employees, bringing them into the mix. Um, so it, it's a, you know, it's a great thing. And I think that one of the problems that we have in our industry right now is the fact that you're, you're seeing very, very little de novos because the, the process has become so onerous, um, in terms of like the, the amount of capital that you need to raise, 
the regulatory process, you know, getting things approved, the the amount the business plan, the amount of things that you have to have, uh, you know, so it's just it's very, very difficult to start a de novo bank right now. And then a lot of people, you know, qu will question the business model and say, oh, well, what's the need for it? You know, technology is advancing at such a pace that, you know, you really, you know, that you, we need less banks now than more banks, that kind of thing. So but I but as I've said before, it, it totally depends on what you're doing, what's your niche, how you're doing it. Um, I absolutely think we, we should have a lot more de novo banks. We need we need de novo banks in this industry. We can't let we cannot allow this industry to consolidate down to like 2000 banks. We have to get de novos going again. We have to because de novos are good for everything. They're good for, uh, but you know, they're good for bankers' careers. They're they're good for growing employment in your area. Um, they're good for competition. They're good for innovation. They're good. They're good for a lot of different things. Um, uh, so so again, I just thought I thought this was a great story here. I thought that I could kind of work this into a little bit of of trying to understand a little bit about how a de novo bank starts. What are some of the challenges there? But I think it's very interesting too. And I just, I want to point out this last thing and that was their, their hiring practices and basically looking at, uh, you know, we didn't want anybody with less than 10 years experience. So there is a, and there's kind of good and bad to that. So the, the good thing is you're getting people with experience. The bad thing is that, you know, people with experience usually cost a lot of money. They're usually not cheap. Um, but one of the things that I learned in the de novo experience that I went through was that a lot of people are willing to take a pay cut to go to a de novo bank because the de novo bank is going to offer a totally different kind of culture, totally different kind of atmosphere. Um, you know, the problem with working at a lot of bigger banks is that it's very bureaucratic. Uh, it can it can feel rather lifeless at times. You know, people, you know, people can be very cold. You know, you have every year's, you know, you have 10 great years and then all of a sudden you have one bad year in, you know, one bad year because the economy's in the dumps. And all of a sudden you're persona non grata. You know, you you stink. You know, they, they want to kick you out the door. And um, and that's it's a very, you know, what have you done for me lately kind of business. And, you know, and again, not that, you know, again, you know, you got to perform everywhere, right? You got to, you got to do a good job everywhere. But, uh, but the, the culture is just more, uh, it's more human. It's more family friendly. Again, these, these guys talked about the whole family thing, but, uh, but I do find it fascinating because these guys basically used a kind of a poaching strategy that, that, you know, we're not going to, um, you know, we're not going to um, hi hire anybody that's not already an experienced professional in industry. You know, we're going to pluck, you know, people who are already trained and experienced from other banks. And you could still do that, but I don't know how great that strategy is going to work in the years ahead as people as, you know, and, and that's a whole different conversation on, tr on, on issues with overall training within the industry, can, consolidation of banks, uh, the aging of bankers as bankers are getting older, you know, people with more experience are leaving the workforce. Um, so th there's going to be challenges to that model going forward. And I will also say that as a 52 billion asset bank, we're operating in seven states with 3,500 employees. You better believe they're taking applications now. You better believe that they're they're hiring young people and they're training them up and getting them rolling. I mean, once you be once you get to be that size of a bank, uh, you can't just simply hire other experienced people from you know you, you get you get too big. I mean, once you start having thousands of employees, like yeah, you can't just run around and just hire nothing but experienced people. I mean, at some point, like you, you know, in order to continue that organic growth and continue to grow, you got to bring in you know, fresh bodied college graduates and, and just maybe people are out of high school too, that, that just come in and you train them up and you teach them how to do their job and, and, and off they go and you, you hope they do a good job for you. Um, but I, but again, I think that what they were talking about was really in the early years and in the, at the heart of what they were, their hiring practice at the very beginning of the company. And, um, and, and again, and, and I, like, so you said, so I, I think it's a very interesting dynamic and you could, I could have, I could have a conversation for three hours, uh, just talking about that, the hiring aspect of it and why you would do different things and looking at different people and stuff like that. So, uh, okay. And the last thing I want to say is as a tie into this, this is a book that I got a long time ago, and this is called good guys finish first 
Reflections of a CEO and How to Start a De Novo Community Bank. This uh, this book was absolutely incredible. It tells the story of you know of a, of a bank CEO who basically was highly experienced and started and run a couple of banks. And he talks about the whole experience of one startup bank in particular in Georgia that he started and grew and then sold. And it talks about like everything he had to do through the process, like how he got the bank up and running, what, you know, all the nuts and bolts of it, what his experience was, you know, growing the bank and then ultimately selling the bank years later. So I'll do a whole book review on this. And I think people will really find uh, I think people will really find just the whole process of starting a bank very, uh, very interesting. So. But uh, anyway, I will wrap up with, if you like this episode, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe as that always helps the channel. Remember, we are on YouTube, Rumble, and all major podcast platforms. Please be sure to leave your comments down below as I always enjoy getting back to everybody. Make sure to check out some of the other content on the channel, and I will see everybody again real soon. Thanks a lot.